Well, do you have a story of triumph? I'm not talking about one of those epic stories like Rocky Balboa at the end of every one of the movies knocking out his opponent. I'm not talking about uh, the epic story of the 1980s uh, Miracle on Ice where the United States hockey team right, not only beats Russia, but they go on to the gold medal round and they get the gold from beating Finland. I'm not even talking about that epic story of triumph if you're a Cowboys fan. I mean, right, we all know we have a winning record against the Steelers. And not only a winning record, I mean, we have the largest margin of victory win as a Cowboys fan. I'm not talking about those epic stories of triumph. I'm just talking about one of those moments where you're like, yeah, I was victorious. Well, several weeks ago, uh, it was a beautiful spring day, and my family, we were like, well, we should go for a walk. It was one of those spring days that was kind of nestled between two snowstorms. And so we uh, got Lola, a dog, on our leash, and we started making our way out of our driveway onto the, the main road. And as we walked out of our driveway, my oldest daughter, Kiera, that's, she, well, she's almost 18, she's several inches taller than me, looks at me and says, old man. Now, I know that I'm getting older and the longer my hair grows, like I know that the gray's coming in, but I'm not old yet. So I fire back at her and I go, what? You know, with all of that disdain, she looks at me and squares me up and goes, I challenge you to a race. And before I could say anything, she goes, and I'm going to beat you. Well, I pause because here's the thing. Up to that point, I mean, we have raced many, many times over the years, and I've always beaten her. And I knew that one day, one day, she was going to be able to beat me. But I knew on that day, no way. So I look at her, I say, challenge accepted. Kim, my wife, she was going to be the, the, the judge. And so we got the starting line. Kira's and my toes were on that line. We looked up the road and uh, we picked out a, a road sign that was some about 75 to 100 yards away. And we agreed that was going to be the finish line. We both leaned in. And as we're leaning in, all I could think uh, to myself was, she can't beat me today. She can't beat me today. She can't beat me today. One day she can beat me, but not today. Well, Kim said go. And for the first 20 yards, I mean, we were shoulder to shoulder. I mean, shoulder to shoulder. But here's what I knew. About yard 35, yard 40, the road really kicked incline. And I just knew that was my moment. Yeah, I might be some 30 years older than her, but that was my moment because I knew mentally when the road kicked, the elevation kicked, the incline kicked, like if I could break her there, I would win. So we hit that incline and I kicked it in with this old body. I mean, every one of my muscles screamed out for me to stop, but mentally I'm like, I have to win. And all of a sudden when that incline kicked in, I started to surge past her and I knew I had her. Cross the finish line. And who won? This guy won. And I looked at her and I said, not today. I mean, do you have a story of triumph? <laughs> you see, I think for all of us, for all of us, you know, we want to have moments, not just a race against one of your kids, but we want to live a life of triumph. And so we're kicking off this series titled Triumph within your reach. Because so many times, I mean, triumph, victory, the win is within our reach, but it feels so far away. And so we're going to be navigating through following the life of one person that, well, lived a story of triumph. But here's the thing about his story. I think his story reflects so much like your and my story. Why? Because, because it was, it's not one of those perfect, epic stories of triumph. It's a story that has twists and turns, ups and downs. And well, the story of this one person, well, he didn't even see it within himself. But before we get to his story, we have to kind of lead into what was taking place that right before his story starts to emerge. So we got to go back a ways to, well, the story of Moses. 
Moses was called by God to lead, lead his Israelites out of captivity in Egypt. And so Moses does that epic story. He leads them out, and then God forms a covenant between Moses, the Israelites, and himself. God said, hey, I'm all in. I'm going to do everything I've promised to do with you. I'm asking you to well, have that equal commitment to me. Let's keep the covenant together. Well, Moses and the Israelites, I mean, some moments they kept that covenant. Many times they didn't. You can read about the story of Moses and, and the Israelites during this period in the, in the ancient Jewish text we call it the Old Testament in the books of Exodus, Le- Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's all about this time period. And right at the very end of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses' life is coming to an end. And Moses hands a leadership baton off to a guy named Joshua. And we actually have an entire book of our Old Testament titled Joshua. And that story is about this baton of leadership being passed off between Moses and Joshua. God coming to Joshua and say, hey, Joshua, you are the person to lead my people, the Israelites, into the promised land. But remember, Joshua, keep my covenant. God says, hey, I'm all in. I'm never going to break the covenant. Don't break the covenant with me. And one of the things that God said to Joshua was, was to, when you go into the promised land, you got to drive out all the Canaanites. And why is this? And this is so important. Because the Canaanites worshipped vile, morally corrupt, pagan uh, re- religious practices following Baal and Asherah. I mean, we're talking complete moral debauchery. Child sacrifice was part of this. And what God knew is if Joshua and the Israelites didn't drive the Canaanites out of the promised land, they would start following these pagan religious belief systems. And that they would turn from God, they would break the covenant and start following them. Well, Joshua kind of drove out the Canaanites, but he didn't drive all of them out. And guess what happened? The Israelites broke their covenant with God and started to worship Baal and Asherah. And all of this leads into this kind of next season for the Israelites. And this recorded in this book called Judges. So Joshua's life's coming to an end and God knows he needs someone to help lead his people. And so he ushers in a whole list of these judges. Now, this word judge now, like when we think of like the Supreme court justice or maybe your local uh, municipality judge, but that's not this type of judge. Thousands of years ago, this judge was some type of like tribal chieftain military warrior. Think about these judges like a combination of uh, William Wallace, you know, Mel Gibson in Braveheart, and uh, Katniss Everdeen in The Hunger Games, and of course, the ultimate fighter, the ultimate warrior, right? Chuck Norris. So these judges was a combination, combination of these three. So when you think about judges, this is the image that you should be thinking about. And so chapter one of this book called Judges is all about Joshua not doing what God has told him to do is drive out all the Canaanites from the promised land. Chapter one was all about the Israelites following in this pagan religious worship that included just complete moral depravity and child sacrifice. And then chapter two, well, the author kind of pulls out and says, hey, the rest of the storyline is going to follow a cycle. And I just wanted you to know what the cycle is so you will understand the rest of this book, this storyline called Judges. And this is what the cycle is. Israel would sin. They would do evil in the eyes of God. They would break the covenant with God. And because they would do that, God would send in foreign oppressors, foreign military, foreign nations to come in because God ultimately wants Israel to to keep their covenant with him. God wants a relationship with him. And so he's sending these foreign oppressors and it would get so bad that at one point Israel would finally repent. And repent just means turn from your way and face God. So they finally turn from their ways, face God and say, hey God, we've broken our covenant. We want to have our relationship with you. And God, being a loving, grace-filled God, would send in a deliverer. And these deliverers were these 
judges, these military chieftain, military warriors. He would send them in, these judges, these deliverers would drive out these foreign oppressors, and this, these judges would enter into or usher into a time of peace for Israel. And this is the cycle. I mean, this gets repeated over and over and over again, not just through the book of Judges, but into this, the season after that with Israel and their kings. And guess what? Guess what? I mean, this kind of happens in our life to this day, doesn't it? So as the author of Judges says, hey, this is a cycle, we get into chapter 3. And chapter 3 kicks off the storyline of all of these deliverers, these judges. And I just, be very transparent, the book of Judges is a very violent, violent book. I mean, just these First stories of Othniel, Ehud, and Deborah. I mean, violent stories of these deliverers driving out these foreign oppressors to usher in peace. Why? Because Israel had turned back to God. Now, there's one judge right at the very beginning. His name's Shamgar, and we know very, very little about. But we do know the epic tales of Othniel, Ehud, and Deborah. After Deborah ushers in peace, there was peace in Israel for 40 years. 40 years of peace. Why? Because Israel had repented, turned back to God, and they were like, we're, we're going to keep our covenant with you, God. God, we're going to only worship you. But then, after Deborah, Israel, well, Israel does what's evil. They, they sin. They turn away from God. And there starts the cycle. And you all know the cycle. What happens after they sin? God sends in oppressors. This time it was the Midianites for seven years. And it was a horrible time. The Midianites would come in and the Israelites would actually have to go hide into the hill country, into caves. I mean, they would leave their town, their villages, their homes, and they would just go hide out because the Midianites were so evil. It was so bad that the Midianites, as soon as the Israelites would plant their crops, I mean, their only way to eat, the Midianites would come in and other armies would come in and completely decimate their crops. I mean, it was a bad seven years, so bad that starvation hit the land. Then, and here's the thing, you, you all know what comes next after then because you know the cycle. But before we get to that step of the cycle, here's what we have to understand, that our actions have consequences. And those consequences reflect our actions. So many times, we think consequences are always bad. But consequences are neither good or bad. I mean, I say this to my, my daughters all the time. I mean, they have heard this countless times. I'm like, consequences aren't good or, or bad. They just reflect your actions. And so if the actions are good, there's good consequences. And if the actions are bad, there's bad consequences. And God is saying, hey, this covenant relationship, this covenant relationship just is going to reflect, Israel, your actions. So then we get to then. And what happens? The third step in the cycle? The Israelites, they repent. They cry out to God for help. They turn from their pagan worship and they face a, a pure and holy God. And like, God, we are so sorry. And what does God do? Everything he has promised to do. So he sends in a prophet. A, a prophet was just simply a, a spokesperson for God. And so God sends in this spokesperson. And well, this is what God has to say. He goes, I brought you out of slavery in Egypt, and I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove you out of your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I'm the Lord your God. You must not worship the, the gods of the Amorites in, in the land you now live. God was saying, I've kept the covenant with you. Don't forget that. I have done everything I've promised to do. And then God says, hey, but you have not listened to me. Hey, Israel, you have not kept your side of the covenant. You have not kept your side of the agreement. You have broken, fractured the relationship. You see, what we have to hold on to is that obedience, obedience to God is tethered to our love for God. Let me be very direct for a moment. Do you say all the time that you love God? Do you say all the time that you love Jesus? 
But are you obedient to God? Are you obedient to Jesus? And I'm not talking about perfection. No, no, no. I'm talking about the pursuit. None of us are perfect. But is your pursuit to obey God, is your pursuit to live a life that reflects Jesus? You see, to truly love God, to truly love Jesus, your pursuit must to obey as well. Those two things are tethered together. And then God sends in an angel, which is really just God's presence. And he goes and he finds Gideon. And Gideon uh, was threshing wheat at the bottom of the wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. And in moments like this in the Bible, it's so easy just to glance over, to move through, just to think that this is just kind of a transitional statement. But this is so telling. Gideon sitting there. Hiding, hiding from the Midianites, scared. He's not some mighty warrior. No, 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 he's in hiding, hoping that they won't find him. And not only is he in hiding, hoping they won't find him, he's by himself threshing wheat, which this, again, for us thousands of years later, doesn't mean much. But the significance of this was Gideon wasn't part of some great business family empire where they had servants to do this task. No, no, no. Gideon was doing it by himself. And it was a a small enough amount of wheat that he only could do it. I mean, he's living in poverty and hiding out. This is where we, we find this mighty deliverer, this judge. But the angel, God, comes up to get Gideon. And you know what name God gives for Gideon? This is great. He goes, mighty hero. Mighty hero. Yep, the same guy who's hiding out, threshing wheat by himself. Mighty hero. And Gideon doesn't even pay attention to this title, to this name. Gideon just fires back and says, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? And Where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and has handed us over to the Midianites? I mean, Gideon is firing back at God, saying, hey, God, where where are you? Why have you abandoned us? Why have you allowed all this to happen? And how do you think God replies? I mean, Gideon fired off at God. God ignores him, doesn't respond to all of his accusations. God just says, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. <laughs> I mean, Gideon just fires off at God. And God just doesn't, doesn't respond to him. You see, here's the truth. God's response might be a non-response. But that non-response might actually lead to his response. I mean, are you sitting there right now thinking to yourself, well, God, where are you? Why aren't you responding to me? Are you thinking to yourself, hey, I, I've said all of this stuff to God. I've prayed to God. I've been honest to God. I, I've, I've opened my heart to God, and he's not responding. Just maybe, just maybe. God's non-response will actually lead to his response. Because so many times we think God owes us a response. God doesn't. What God wants from us is us to obey, for us to follow, for us to keep our eyes locked on him because God knows what's best for us. And then God looks at Gideon and says, I'm sending you, Gideon. I'm sending you. But Gideon's still in this bad place. And he's like, Seriously, God, you're sending me, but, me, but, me, but, me. I mean, how many, how many but statements do you have for God? God's wanting you to do something. You're like, yeah, 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 God, but, but not me. I mean, you know God's moving in you, but not me. 
You know God's kind of nudging you and you're like, but not me. I mean, Gideon's like, hey, God, but not me. How can I rescue Israel? And Gideon's ready with his entire response. I mean, he has it ready. He goes, he goes my clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh and I'm the least of my family. Hence why Gideon was hiding out from the Midianites, threshing wheat by himself. I mean, Gideon was just ready to fire back on God, but God. And think about this moment. Gideon, I mean, looking at his life, I mean, weakest, whole tribe, the least of his whole family. And what had God named, called Gideon? Mighty hero, the weakest, the least, the coward, mighty hero. See, Gideon actually asks a question that God actually responds to. I mean, the other questions, the other statements, God doesn't respond. But when Gideon asks the question, how can I rescue Israel? Do you know how God responded to Gideon? He actually responded this time. He says, I will be with you. See, that's the game changer. Gideon, the judge, the deliverer, was a coward. But God's presence, when God is with you, God called him mighty hero. Not because Gideon was a mighty hero. Not because Gideon came from a family of mighty heroes. No, because God was with him. Let me ask you this question. What, what name is God calling you? What name is God calling you? Right now, is fear and anxiety completely overwhelming you? God is calling you courageous. Are you being attacked on every side? God is calling you victorious. Why? Because he's with you. Is addiction just haunting you? God is calling you overcomer. Uh, Were you raised in a family where dad wasn't present, mom wasn't present, you had no love from your parents? God is calling you. Son, and God is calling you daughter. Why? Because God is with you. Are you all alone? God is calling you friend. Why? Because God is with you. Do you feel completely unwanted? God is calling you chosen. Do you Do you find yourself just uh, feeling unworthy that you're not good enough? God is calling you master peace. Is your past trying to hold you back? God is calling you free. Is your sin shaming you? God is calling you redeemed. And is Jesus the subject of your life? God is calling you brand new, that you're a new creation. Why? Because God is is with you. What name? What name is God calling you? And you've got to hold on to that. It's it's not because of anything about you. You don't have to see it in you. Because God is with you. God, the Almighty, Heavenly Father, is with you. And when God is with you, the name he calls you is who you are. So, maybe right now, in this season of life, you can't see how God sees you. You don't feel how God feels about you. You wake up and go to bed at night and you just think that you're not and you fill in the blank. But what you have to hold on to, it's the same thing that Gideon had to hold on to. That when God is with you, who can be against you? When God is with you, it's a game changer. 
game changer. It's a game changer. What name? What name? What name? Is God calling you? Let's pray. Lord, I'm thankful that you see in us things that we don't see within us. God, I'm so thankful that you call out names to us even when we don't feel it within us. Lord, I just pray for every single person listening, watching, that they'll hold on to the name that you are calling them. Mighty hero, courageous, victorious, overcomer, son, daughter, friend, chosen, masterpiece, free, redeemed, brand new. Heavenly Father, thank you for walking with us and being for us and seeing in us things that we can't even see within ourselves. In your name we pray. Amen.